I have a lazy tongue. Let's not make it weird. I have a lazy tongue. I find, especially the older I get, the lazier it's become. I don't enunciate. Do you enunciate? And so when I have to listen to my sermons as I edit them down to put them online for future viewing, it is such a painful process. Like, why do you speak like that? And so I try little things like uh, the tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips. The tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips before I preach. Of course, I have to do it fairly early on because if you see me sitting there during How Great Thou Art, (laughs) saying the tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips, you just might find it to be a little weird. Thank you, sir. I have every confidence in yours and Brandon's ability. We'll see. So it's good to practice tongue twisters if you do anything in public. And when you were a kid, you probably had some of these in your back pocket. But here's one I enjoy. Sinful Caesar sipped his snifter, seized his knees and sneezed. Can everybody else say it? Let's give it a try. Sinful Caesar sipped his snifter, seized his knees and sneezed. Oh, that's not so bad. Not so bad. Now you have to speed it up. Sinful Caesar sipped a snifter, seized a sneeze, and seized. I couldn't do it. Here's another one. Just click the button if you don't mind, big guy. There you go. This one's hard. I I have a hard time with this one. The seething sea ceaseth, and thus the seething sea sufficeth us. You want to try that one? Yeah, let's give that one a try. The seething sea ceaseth, and thus the seething sea sufficeth us. There, already I feel confident. I don't know if you're able to, Brandon, but I've got one more. All right, this one's difficult. Betty Butter bought a bit of butter, but she said this butter is bitter. If I put it in my batter, it will make my batter bitter. But a bit of better butter will make my batter better. So Betty Butter bought a bit of better butter and made it her batter better. Woo, because we're warmed up now. We can enunciate. There we go. No longer do we have lazy tongues. A tongue is a very useful tool. A very useful tool. It helps us with taste. Did you know there are 9,000 taste buds on your tongue? 9,000. Of course, it helps you with swallowing. Did you know that 85% of people can curl their tongue? Did you know 85% of you just tried it? (laughs) Of course, it helps you to sing. We can ask our dear friends over here to my left. It helps you to speak. Did you know that your tongue actually shapes your teeth in your mouth? This is true, especially when you're young, but even throughout adulthood. I have gone through two orthodontists with two kids, so I know this very well. When my son Sam was having his braces on, he said, you know, what happens is the tongue is constantly pushing at the mouth, the roof of the mouth, the teeth, and pushing things where they need to be. And then again, when we brought Paxton in this week to the orthodontist, he's got a a front tooth finally coming down, and it's on a 45-degree angle. It does not look pretty. He said, don't worry. The mouth will do its job, and whatever the tongue can't do... I can fix. He didn't say for how much, (laughs) admittedly, but he said we can fix it. So the tongue is a useful tool that can be used in many ways, but James tells us if you're not careful, thank you, sir, if you're not careful, that tool can get twisted pretty easily. Oh, we really do have the best AV team, don't we? Let's give it up for the AV team. Thank you, gentlemen. Much appreciated. Here's what James says, and I think you've probably heard this verse before. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they're so large and they're driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, 
but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Whoa, James, easy there, big fella. Talk about fire and brimstone teaching. Holy cow. Surely he's over-exaggerating to make a point. But then when you really stop to think of it, well, he's right. A few words to an umpire can get you ejected from a baseball game. We all know that. A few words from a spouse can leave you with divorce papers. And a few words to your kids can crush their spirit. I'm going to tell a really heart-wrenching story, so I'm going to wait for the phone to stop ringing. There you go. Who calls on a Sunday morning at 10, 11.05? This summer, I was up at the trailer, and I was working around the trailer. I don't even remember what project I was working on, but I do remember that my seven-year-old Paxton had a considerable amount of energy that day, and he was not employing it in any positive direction. And so throughout the morning as I was working on this project, I felt like I was continually tripping over Paxton, that he was always coming up to me needing something at just the wrong time. And I don't even remember what he said or did, but he did something particularly annoying. Just, just that was it. I'd had enough. And I turned around and I snarled at him, What is wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Now tell me that James isn't over-exaggerating. When your dad says to you, there's something wrong with you. Of course, I didn't mean it. He's my little treasure. He's my little boy. I was frustrated, and I just, oh. So he started to tear up, and I took him aside. I got down on his level, and I said, listen, I'm so sorry. There is nothing wrong with you. Just, I was trying to work on this. I was frustrated, and, and I shouldn't have said those words. I'm so sorry. And he looked at me, and he said, it's okay, Daddy. I re-give you. <laughs> I got lucky. Our words are powerful tool. Well, when they get twisted, man, they can do a lot of damage. What's wrong with him? What's wrong with me? In that moment, something was revealed. It's so easy to think that you've got it all together, but then something like that comes out of your mouth and you realize what truly lies within. James continues saying, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed, and they've been tamed by humankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. He says the things that we say can often be poison. I want to do a little exercise with you. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm not going to ask you to say your answer out loud. The question is this. What hurtful words live rent-free in your head? What has someone said to you that maybe even 70 years later you've never forgotten? One time when I was a kid, I, I don't know, 12, 13, something like that, my aunt, my dear aunt, looked at me and she said, you know, Alton, you'd make a really ugly girl. I said, what? Well, your eyes are too deeply set in your head. You'd make a terrible girl. Ugly. 
And I don't know why, but that has stuck with me. I have no desire to transition at this point in my life. But I'm like, my, my eyes, what's going on? What are you talking about? When I was in grade three, I started a brand new school. I moved from one side of the town to the other. And I guess in order to alleviate my discomfort, I was using humor as a tool to uh, integrate myself into the class. And I remember I was exactly where I was, standing on Main Street Stovall, when this kid, who happened to be about four inches taller than me in grade three, looked down at me and said, you know, Walton, you think you're so funny. You think you're the class clown, but nobody's laughing with you. They're all laughing at you. You are not funny. (laughs) I've also heard that in church, by the way. I had an ex once tell me that I've gotten so fat, I was no longer attractive to her. These things... Yeah, and I can appreciate her point of view. But these things, they stay with you. Things that happened over a decade ago and things that happened to me 35, 40 years ago, I still remember them. I don't know if you've ever heard this refrain, but whoever said sticks and stones can break my bones but names will hurt, never hurt me was an idiot. Don't worry, they won't be mad. They called them a name. (laughs) But it's true, isn't it? It's so true. Not this. The words can really, really hurt. In fact, you can fall down and break your arm, and that, that will heal when you're six years old. But there are things that our parents, our aunts, uncles, our friends, our siblings have said to us that have stuck with us over the years. And it shaped our lives because words are a mighty tool, but they can also be a powerful weapon. James continues saying, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Saying, you see how weird that is? How hypocritical that is? Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing, My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Here's a biblical truth that sometimes we have a hard time grasping. That your tongue is a reflection of your heart. Your tongue is a reflection of what's inside. A Greek philosopher asked his servant to provide for him the best dish possible. Bring me the very best dish that you can think of. And the servant prepared a dish of tongue. Obviously, souvlaki dinner wasn't on the table. And he said, I bring you tongue, because it is the best of dishes. With it, we may bless and communicate happiness. With it, we may dispel sorrow, remove despair, cheer the faint-hearted, inspire the discouraged, and say a hundred other things to lift up our fellow humankind. Later, that same philosopher asked his servant to provide the worst dish he could think of. And again, a dish of tongue appeared on the table. The servant said, it is the worst because with it we may curse and break human hearts, destroy reputations, promote discord and strife, set families, communities, and nations at war with each other. And the philosopher said, you are a wise servant. See, church, your tongue is simply a reflection of your heart. And what comes out of it reveals what's inside. It reveals the very best of us, and it reveals the very worst of us. And often, it can happen very close to one another. So, the question I have is, 
if James tells us to tame the tongue, and if he says that nobody can do it, then how in the world am I supposed to tame my tongue? And the answer is, you don't tame the tongue. You change your heart. And that tames your tongue. I, I think you've probably read this scripture before. Jesus said something very similar to all of this. He said, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up where? In his heart. That's right. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I remember a couple weeks ago I mentioned that some people said we should throw out the book of James. There's not enough Jesus in it. Let me tell you, Jesus is all through it even if his name only comes up twice. There's an old story about General Robert E. Lee and he was once asked what he thought about a fellow officer in the Confederate Army. And this officer had made some very mean-spirited remarks about General Lee. Stuff that wouldn't make you happy to hear. Well, Lee thought for a moment, and then he said, I would rate him as a pretty satisfactory soldier. And the person who was asking the question seemed troubled. But General, he said, I guess you don't know all of these bad things he's been saying about you. Oh, yes, answered Lee, I know. But I was answering the question of what is my opinion of him, not what is his opinion of me. (laughs) That's the kind of restraint that astounds me. That's the kind of restraint that I aspire to. To have that sort of resolve to always speak the good, even if I'm hurt, even if I'm angry, even if I'm afraid. And often I fail. And I ask myself, how does one get to such a place of Zen? And I realize through the teachings of Jesus and James that it begins here, in my heart. If your heart is full of anger or bigotry or hate, it will manifest itself through the tongue. If your heart is insecure and defensive, it will lash out with a critical tongue. If your heart is afraid, it will build walls out of words. But how do I know the state of my heart? Well, I thought about this all week. I think there's one answer. Just listen to the things you say. Would you say them if Jesus was standing beside you? And I think you have your answer. And it's a sobering thought. And it's funny because Jesus is everywhere all at once, so he's always here. But for some reason, I think I'd tame my tongue a whole lot more if he was standing here beside me. And where do those critical and angry or unkind words come from? Is there something in my heart? Is there something in your heart that you need to surrender to the Lord? Is there something in your life that is so painful that it's expressed verbally and shapes and taints almost everything you do? Is there perhaps a relationship that you need to work through? Because that's heart work. Is there an opportunity for you to be in the scriptures every day? Because if you want to shape your heart, that's the way to do it. Do you have opportunity throughout the day to spend time in prayer? Because if you want to shape the way you think and the way you feel, prayer is one of the best ways to do that. And are you asking God to shape your heart and to mold 
your thoughts. Because don't you just find that the closer you walk with Jesus, the closer your heart and thus your tongue align with his will. Right? Which is a great thing because Jesus had a warning for all religious leaders who don't have a rein on their tongue. And so I take this very seriously. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. And this is a fair warning to all who would desire to be teachers of the gospel. This is no game. But the good news, the very good news in all of this, is that while our words can hurt, they can also heal. After all, gospel just means good news. And St. John called Jesus, what? The Word. Words can create. Words can heal. Words can comfort. Words can save. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. How beautiful. Words can save. When I was... 16 years old, I didn't grow up in a Christian household, and I wasn't churched, and I started dating this this beautiful girl named Jackie, and we had a very long relationship for grade 11. It lasted three weeks. (laughs) And during that time, she invited me to her youth group's big trip at Binghamton Park out near Cambridge. And Big weekend, bumper cars, games, activities, 400 teenagers there, and I said, okay, I'll go. But then we broke up, so I figured I'm not going anymore. Then her older sister, who, by the way, wasn't a big fan of me, she called me up, because this is before texting, and she said, listen, I know you guys broke up, and I talked to Jackie, and it's cool with her, if you still came, we think you should still come. And I thought to myself, I wonder how many cute girls are in that youth group. (laughs) So I said, yes, I will come. Uh, I went. There was a guy there. His last name was Dewey. I don't know his first name, but he got up there on Friday night and he started talking about Jesus, and I spent my night scoping out the talent there around me. Saturday morning, we got up, and again, he's talking about Jesus, and people are singing songs about Jesus. It was really weird. In the afternoon, we played some games and stuff, and I did meet a pretty girl. That evening, he preached about Jesus. The next Sunday morning, I was really growing good at tuning out all of that God stuff. Whether it was in the singing or whatever, I was able to just, but you know, you know, caught myself on a Sunday morning starting to hum along with some of those choruses. And I started singing along. And then Dewey got up one last time to preach and he started talking about the gospel. And before I knew it, I was laser focused on every single word he said. And when he was done, After we'd all prayed the sinner's prayer, I left that building in tears because I knew something big had just happened. The course of my life had just changed, and I knew it. Folks, the tongue can be a powerful weapon or an amazing tool. If Jackie's sister hadn't called me up and invited me out, if Dewey, who was probably some overworked youth pastor, hadn't shown up and spent that time preparing just the right words and then allowing the Holy Spirit to make up whatever else he was lacking that day. Without those words, I would not be standing before you. And I bet, as I look out upon all of you, you can think of people in your life who have said just the thing you needed to hear at just the right time. And it changed your life. 
Always remember the power of the tongue. It's a spark that can light a fire that destroys, but it can also ignite a spiritual revolution. It can tear down walls that divide. It can set captives free. It all depends on how we choose to wield it. So, dear church, tame that tongue and don't get it twisted. Let us pray.